Hello. Don in London, hello. It's February 24th, 2013, Sunday morning, nice and grey out. My videos all about recovery from addiction to either substance or behaviour. My addictive substance, alcohol, my behaviour equally addictive around people, places and things, trying to be perfect and never so. So for decades a drinker and for decades probably not experiencing the truth of life just as it might have been. When we take the edge off with a drink to feel convivial or joyful or both or to let go our inhibitions or whatever it might be, drink allows us to access something maybe we are not aware of, our emotions as they are. And sometimes when we drink too much then the emotions become out of out of, at the extremes where we don't really understand how to rein them back in. So lots of things happen under the influence of a drink, drug or substance or particular people who kick off deep, deep feelings normally of lust and romance and love or the opposite uh, rejecting hating and not wanting love from them and if we're at the extremes then we're probably out of balance with our normal way of responding to life and reacting to life so for a long time I was not very good with my feelings I now realize but I didn't realize it at the time because the feelings I had seemed to work adequately once I had a drink inside me and that's not helpful so I became, drink became my best friend, then it became my worst enemy, but it took a long time for me to realise what was going on. So by the time I needed to stop drinking, I couldn't. I had no way out. I didn't know how to stop, because it always took the pain away, and I was so depressed clinically, and so distressed and disorderly, that I had no way out. So I was lucky, some professionals got me dry and it was the professionals who said why don't you go to a fellowship called AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. So I did, reluctantly and certainly not with a desire to stop drinking. I went there to judge other people and see, well I did, I went there to judge other people and see whether they were sober because of something I hadn't got. And actually they had something which I didn't have, uh, more of a hold on truth more of a hold on emotions, understanding what was going on in the moment, rather than walking away from it and wondering why everything seemed wrong. So the Fellowship of AA has become the very backbone of my sobriety, and it's a fellowship of men and women who speak for themselves where they will. So I don't speak for anybody in AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, don't speak for you if you're in it, and I don't represent AA, I just share how AA helps me on a daily basis work out what to do based on truth and learning the wisdom of it. So I share about AA and I share the AA preamble so if you're a newcomer or thinking or have a desire to stop this is what the fellowship is there to do. And it slows me down to read it out. I don't recite it, I try not to remember it deliberately so I do have to read it and then it means more in the moment of now. So this is the AA preamble and then I'll share some of my thoughts and feelings today based on recovery. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. So that's it. Common problem, common, common ground and help each other recover from alcoholism and stay, re stay in recovery one day at a time. So my name is Don and, I'm a, and I am an alcoholic in recovery just for today. That's all that matters. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking and I didn't go with a desire to stop drinking. I just wanted a desire for the world to improve and I would try something new in order that that might happen. So I went without a desire to stop, but that is the only requirement, a desire to stop. No one's going to challenge you on whether you should or should not be there. 
There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. So free at the point of entry. Nobody's going to take money off you. And there is no great war chest anywhere in the fellowship of AA. It's just what it is. An organisation which works pretty much on a daily basis. A fellowship working on a daily basis. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organisation or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. So the fellowship is not there to help you in your causes or whatever, but you have every right and freedom to follow your path. So fellowship for sober, so the rest of your life can happen. And nobody can step on your toes or your outlook. And often people share their outlooks on life. And they can be attractive or unattractive, depending on your own views and beliefs. So you keep your views and beliefs, and they change through time as you choose. But not necessarily anything to do with AA, because the fellowship is there for one thing. And as it says here, our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. So there's no, no magic wand being waved, no special categories where you are in or you are out of various parts of the fellowship. The fellowship is there for men and women with a desire to be sober. But you will find people do clump together and find that they work together within their own communities, within the fellowship, which is quite normal. It's a very normal thing. Like attracts like. Maybe that's why I eventually said, yes, I am an alcoholic and I ought to try out AA. But I didn't want to be controlled by anything or anyone. And I found that nobody, well, the fellowship itself, does not control people. So you'll still find very opinionated people like me uh, who go to meetings, share our experience, strength and hope. And if it has anything worthwhile in it, take it. And if it's no good to you, reject it. But it takes time to work out because we're a bit addled when we get there first. We're not quite sure. And I was very frightened of just living, let alone anything else. And I was worried that somebody might try and make me a believer in God or their God and that I didn't like the idea of so the higher power is very important and my higher power is the truth, love and wisdom I learn from other people who have greater knowledge and experience of many things inside and outside the fellowship of AA so here are my thoughts and feelings this morning feelings and thoughts feelings come first and then we think about them if we've actually plugged into how am I feeling today if we plug into that, then we start to understand what emotional, emotional and spiritual is. So my feelings and thoughts this morning, 24th of February 2013. Sober or drunk, we are still having an emotional and spiritual experience. It's just the quality of the emotional and spiritual experience we might question. The quality of life, the quality of our experience in the moment, all contingent on our ability to make free choices and with as little impairment of truth as possible, question mark. And that's important, you know, can we actually see the truth of now? And how much is that impaired by the information we're getting? And how we interpret it? So if I'm drunk, I'm not really able to interpret it very well. Or I may judge it with a great deal of prejudice based on my drunkenness. Or my feelings about the world. A letter from a friend recently saying I had no choice but to be sober and they still have the choice to be drunk and be happily so today and any day. It disturbed me and um, the letter from my friend about the choice and their sobriety, their choice and the, their sobriety, they are far away and not part of fellowship today so they cannot be identified which is why I'm just sharing this. Their free choice, their free choice to, as they put it, enjoy being pissed and enjoy the conviviality and joy of company of people drinking to confusion and letting go of their fears and tribulations that's what they like sometimes I can be irritated when people say I have no choice but to be sober and this friend of mine he irri irritated me and he's always said you, you have no choice because you're a type 1 diabetic so 
I have sometimes I can be irritated when people say I have no choice but to be sober because I already have made up my mind that sober is best on a daily basis. They do cite my other ailment, type 1 diabetes, is a reason not to drink. And the consequences if I did drink would be startling and disastrous because one drink would not do, do me any good. It wouldn't fix in the way it used to. And I would, I would drink fast and hard for oblivion. I know that. Why else do it? Why else do it? And then wake up with that ghastly feeling. I never used to have hangovers, but I'm sure if I did try again, I would. They do cite my other end of type 1 diabetes as a reason not to drink, and the consequences, if I did, would be startling and disastrous. Actually, type 1 diabetes is not a reason to stop drinking for somebody like me. If I were inclined to drink, other chronic ailments would be a good reason to drink. Or would other ailments be a good reason to drink? As an alcoholic, this is me, hardwired to be drinking, something unusually the higher power restores me to sanity first thing in the morning. Or I would be taking a morning top-up on the road to hell. Freedom of choice in recovery means I don't drink one day at a time. And reality and the emotional and spiritual experience will be as good as it gets just for a day. There is no guarantee it's going to be a wonderful day just because I don't drink. It just means I can enjoy miserable or the good, bad and ugly of life just as it is. But I don't have to resort to changing my perception of reality with a drink. Why drink? Because it changes your feelings and perceptions. That's why people do it. That's why people get drunk at Christmas and feel horrible on New Year's. Or, you know, normal. Well, I don't know if there is such a thing as normal normal drinking these days. Not for me anyway. Well, my normal drinking is tea, coffee and water. Yeah, I'll say that. Anyway, freedom. If we have a desire to be sober and be in recovery and attend Alcoholics Anonymous fellowship meetings, we do become part of a higher power. So even on my first day, I was, you know, sharing the truth of my crap. You know, how horrible life had turned out. And that's true. It was crap and it was horrible. And, you know, I had no safe place to be. I was homeless and indigent. And people were indifferent to me. Why else would they be that way? There was no other way to be because I was unmanageable. So, we become part of the higher power. It doesn't really matter what you understand of God, as long as your understanding of God is yours. And if you don't believe in God, that's equally what it can be. <coughs> so, when we talk about, when I talk about truth, love and wisdom being the higher power, uh, I, go with, I go with what Gandhi said. He said, God is truth, love. God is love. You know, the most powerful things we have around us is truth and love. And the collective truth and love will take us on and hold us long enough till we can make sense of life again. So fellowship worked in that respect. Although I didn't want it to, I wanted to be in command of it. I wanted to find where the the leadership was in AA and of course there are no leaders in AA it's just people you meet on a daily basis so when I say I'm grateful for AA being there what I am is grateful for every single person who goes to AA on a daily basis because they are the constituent parts of the higher power and I was on my first day because I was helping old timers remember just how horrible it was in the olden days and how the higher power works, be it God, the higher power of many people with experience, strength and hope about recovery, will work if you can, can work with what you've got. One day long, being in recovery and having made a decision to let go of my self-will, in other words, being control, I started to contribute and, my, and be part of a power greater than me. That was fellowship. And then I realised wisdom was coming from all directions, not just linking fellowship. And I didn't know very much about emotional and spiritual. Even though I felt inadequate, it was my inadequacy which was helping everyone else remember what it was like to be living sober one day at a time. In our most negative and highly volatile state as a newcomer, we make a difference by being part of something bigger than ourselves. The growing and ever-changing wisdom available in fellowship one day at a time. So you know, fellowship is good as the people you're with one day at a time 
and life is good as it can be with the people you're li living with or around you one day at a time. So, the collective experience, strength and hope, which helps everyone with their emotional and spiritual awakening is available one step at a time in recovery. First, and this is me, recognising that I was powerless over alcohol and if I took a drink life would start back on an un 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 unmanageable track. And it was okay to recognise just how difficult, difficult it was to stop drinking by admitting and accepting my situation on a daily basis meant that life would improve gradually one day at a time. And there will always be emotional and spiritual upsets which can make life good, bad or ugly, usually romance and finance. And this is where fellowship works if we are working at sober first. If we're sober first then you know our emotions can go all over the place. It's not about controlling our emotions, it's about experiencing our emotions and why we feel the extremes of life and where we find balance. So it's not suppression and control mechanisms in your head. But you can't control emotions. They're there. You can suppress them and try and put them away when, when they are extreme and you can't deal with them. So and there will always be an emotion, emotional and spiritual, spiritual upsets. Sober first and the rest of life following on. My absolute priority is sober first and then I can learn the truth of now. How to love people and be loved back by people and keep on learning the wisdom of what I can and cannot do. There is no disgrace in sobriety. There may be disgrace and ego when we judge others in their actions. And when they judge us with prejudice, this is sadly true, when people judge us with prejudice, when I say I'm an alcoholic in recovery one day at a time, sometimes people don't like it. They think, oh no, he's an alcoholic. And it's bullshit, all this recovery stuff. But then my self-prejudice can be inflamed and very undermining of me if I react in anger. So, you know, I don't mind it. My, see, my friend irritates me because he knows he's wrong. But he also knows he's right. And he's a very clever intellectual. And he's very naughty. Anyway, I still, I, I don't want to be like my friend, still holding on to the old life of grudge and judgment. Judging me as unfit to be a drinker again, which is absolutely true. And their reasons are not my reasons for being sober. He thinks I can't drink because I'll die. Well, actually, the truth will die. And I might follow on. So that's where I am with it. If I thought like them and behaved like them, I would have started drinking again and then be a, and then a speedier end to life than the one I'm living. So I know why I don't want to drink because I prefer truth, love, wisdom, growing as I keep on learning about it. And I can't do that with drink inside me, but my friend feels that it liberates his mind to think big. Well, actually, drink enables your mind to think as big as your head is. That bit. I'm not taking in much from outside. So, actually, the spiritual experience when drunk feels bigger and more rewarding some of the time because all we can see is our own outlook and not the bigger picture. So, it's very, very easy to be persuaded that drink has its place or drugs have their place mind-expanding experiences or life-changing experiences through drugging and going through the extremes of emotions. But they're only the extremes of emotions in the mind, which is as big as your head. And you exclude all the other perceptions which are available to you without a drink. And it's called reality. And, you know, reality is expanding all the time. It really is and our perceptions of it are, if we're open to it, and our senses are working, rather than shutting them down and having an inside world which we think is bigger, but it's not. Anyway, so I need to forgive and understand that there are two elements to my friend's dilemma. First is self-prejudice run riot and denial of it, so he can keep on drinking. And second, prejudice against fellowship which failed him miserably. He forgets how we implored him to be careful with himself and to do what he felt was right anyway. But as soon as there was even a whiff 
this is it yeah yeah he forgets how we employed implored him we asked him to be careful with himself and to do what he felt was right and find the right answers which worked for him the width of any judgment of his behavior evoked a rage against fellowship it did and the strength of desire the strength of lust and love the strength of attraction to power all these things came up and absolute besotted love and infatuation with the girl well that's normal for men get infatuated well you know it's normal if however which way your preferences are if you if you're absolutely besotted with somebody everything everything seems peculiar well it's what it is and I'm glad we have those things in us but what it did it, it evoked every vice and rejection rather than any sort of virtue and even people, people trying to help and and uh, be close to my people trying to be helpful and close to my friend also relapsed over the years on romance and finance but they came back to fellowship and they're still in it but my my very good intellectual thinking friend rejects it anyway my friend is still out there still alive raging and kicking still alive and I have gratitude his constitution is strong and there is hope to, is, is hope for them today and you know they are they, the, the torment that my friend went through and the passion I understand so well I've experienced it what he hasn't really got to is the passion of life and how that experience is long lasting I don't want to make my experience better than anybody else's but the experience and wisdom learned over the years in sobriety is powerful it's powerful because I don't think about drinking although I may talk about it in these videos and I can see the consequences of drink all around me but I can't judge it because I did it and then I didn't know how to get out of it so I'm trying to provide there is hope and the way out even if you've got to the place where I just don't want to live or wake up anymore and that happened to me for years very horrible but to actually get to a place beyond it where I just get normal clinical depression is much better so why does fellowship work for me today? I really began to understand my emotional and spiritual what emotional and spiritual means and what it means to be in fellowship understanding how my head works as a human emotion, emotions and mood will always impact on the way I think in the moment of now I just heard a rustle in the background I just hope I haven't got mice again sorry I'll go back to where I was emotions and mood will always impact on the way I think in the moment of now so if I know what my mood is how I'm feeling what my feelings are I then realize realize how my mood my feelings impact on my thinking and I've been relating about mood good mood more likely to think positively and then behave and act in a positive way a bad mood more likely to have negative thinking and behave negatively and act in a negative way so if I feel good behave I think good behave good think bad behave think sorry feel bad about life my thinking starts to go bad and my actions can be quite bad and the same for ugly ugly feelings or mood or ugly thinking now don't forget we all think we control ourselves so our thinking head says I can push that away I don't need to deal with that now but the more you push it away and don't deal with it the bigger the mountain grows in terms of emotional blockage and when you're in a war situation where people are shooting bullets at you your reactions are on a thinking level rather than emotions because you have to suppress them and then when people come back from war situations many people suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and it's because our feelings are disorderly we can't absorb and understand what's happened and we have no way to process it so what do 
normal human do, beings do under those circumstances, they self-medicate. So alcohol was a great healer, or great suppressor, or allowed people to let it out. So, you know, it's just how far we go with it, and some of us go to addiction. Self-harm, self-medication self to self-harm. So ugly mood, likely to think, to think ugly and behave and act in an ugly way. And worse, when life is a mixture of everything, because this is what happens in life, we get everything at once, good, bad and ugly. Our thinking will be mixed up and our actions are very likely to be very mixed up too. Knowing the way my head works today, emotions and feelings impacting on my thinking. So feelings first and then thinking is driven by our feelings as well, but often we don't really actually see it. So feelings, then thinking, and then the actions I take. It makes me able to see where I can do things well, or make situations work worse by my actions. Asking myself how I feel helps me understand why my thoughts can be very good, very bad, or very ugly, and then the actions which might follow be good, bad, or ugly. Very rarely do hum humans really understand why they do things, because <laughs> normally there's no, no necessity to actually work out how am I feeling, the thinking, and the action. We just do it automatically. But the, uh, where the ego hits is, because we can think precisely what we want, we can be very straight, like an arrow, and very self-centred without taking account of the real feelings of why we're doing something and what about the feelings of other people so very rarely do humans really understand why they do things they feel a need, a want, a desire but they don't really check out what's behind it why do I feel, Because of course we want love or we need love, we need to be able to love people, be loved back so you might be asking yourself sometimes, why on earth did I do that? And you cannot find an answer, other than maybe to justify bad behaviour with a good excuse. Well, I did it because it was the right thing to do. Ignoring, so often we ignore our feelings and suppress them in order to achieve an advantage or not lose face. Or a thousand and one reasons because we ignored our feelings. I have often heard in fellowship that we fake it to make it. And I know some people feel that has helped them. Actually, fake it to make it would be better explained as adopting a new way to see if it works. Adopting a new way of living. It's not fake. There's nothing fake about feelings. So the idea of fake it to make it really is a thinking person's brain working. It's like saying, if I keep on running 100 metres every morning, I'll get faster at it. And every day you wake up and think, I don't feel like doing that. But the thought thinking part says there's an advantage in doing it. And it's an extreme to run 100 metres every morning to improve down to 10 seconds or something like that. It's a thinking part which makes us do certain things. And we think, I don't feel like it, but I'm going to do it. Because there's a, there is an advantage. Or a thousand and one reasons because we ignored our feelings. And uh, fake it to make it, which means pretending to be something you're not, might help a person be sober. So I have heard it often in fellowship, but fake it to make it is a way of pretending to be something you're not until you get to be sober, or you know, you get to be whatever it is you want to be. I wonder if life would have been easier had we been in fellowship to s and we stopped judging each other so no one felt the need to fake anything. And the same is true of life. In loving relationships, breakdowns happen all the time. So family life, community life, society, work, there are always breakdowns happening all the time. And the more the breakdowns that happen in the moment, the more likely the res resolution in the moment, if it's kept to the, the size of the problem in the moment of now, or the issue in the moment of now, Rather than 30 years of crap coming at somebody who's angry and rageful at life and has never sorted out their emotional things. So the more breakdowns on a daily basis, I recommend it. Emotional breakdowns. You can say, I'm having an emotional breakdown, but it's only as big as the moment. 
I feel cross about this, or I feel good about this. Anyway, and the more the breakdowns happen in the moment, the more likely resolution. What makes things go wrong? Simply and most often we just don't recognise or want to recognise our emotional condition, which is someone's screwed us over, or we, fe we fear the truth about our feelings. And then the monstrous deception of disowning feelings as unreal. And, you know, in fellowship, I think I put it down here. Feelings are very real, and when we become more emotionally aware, our choices become much more open and truthful in the moment. Now, when I hear people say feelings are not real, that is a denial of your whole reason for living and that is a monstrous deception disowning our feelings as unreal feelings are very real and when we become more emotionally aware our choices become much more open and truthful in the moment of now emotional and spiritual for me experiencing my feelings understanding why I think the way I do and the actions that follow in the moment is crucial in being able to face reality today. If I hide my feelings, my thoughts are hidden. If I hide my feelings, my thoughts are hidden, and my actions are easily misunderstood. Denial of the truth is a very necessary coping mechanism. When the truth is too hard to digest in one go, we do say to ourselves, I don't believe it. It cannot have happened, and yet it did, and it takes time to understand it. So denial, human beings were not designed to live at extremes all the time, which is why we can deny the truth of now. And we can also deny that somebody loves us, because we're overwhelmed by it and we don't know how to respond back. We have to put on our learning plates and our training wheels emotionally and start ha learning how to love again without a drink in hand. And that could be quite difficult. Mind you, the the good news is that everything's better without a drink. I have come to understand. So, and yet, I don't believe it. It cannot happen. And yet it did, and it takes time to understand. Human beings were not designed to live at extremes all the time. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a denial process, would we? Which is why we can deny the truth of now. And the length of denial is as long as we cannot cope with what is going on, and the reality of what has happened through grief and trauma and stress. So it is, is, it, is it any wonder that most of us find it difficult to become emotionally aware, aware in the moment of now? Give yourself a break. Be a human being human. Learning how to feel right and putting some effort into understanding yourself so your feelings are working your thinking improves and your actions most likely fit with the moment of now. How am I feeling today? I am more geared towards the can do in my life and the cannot do in my life and learning the wisdom to know the difference. I feel okay. I feel like there is much more to learn and not enough time. And that's good. That's a good thing in recovery. There's more to learn and I don't know much more than anybody else does about anything. But providing I'm following the path of truth, love and wisdom inside and outside me, inside fellowship and outside of fellowship, just for a day. And there has been difficult news to digest about matters going back many years about denial and mistrust which impacted on me. When I was broken, years ago, this is, I did get broken. And uh, it was me doing it to me. If I had not been a drinker, and look to self-medicate to, to the point of self-harm, I might question whether this would have happened. Well, it did. But when I was broken, advent advantage was taken by some, and this has come to light, and yet the interpretation and the truth serve no one. I put a question mark there, there. But the truth does serve everyone, even when, we, when the, de the hurt runs deep. So truth serves everyone, even when the hurt runs deep. Because if we don't know the truth, we doubt. We are become doubting. So, you know, sometimes the truth it helps us, and sometimes it hurts us deeply, because we know what's happened. 
and that is why the 12 steps not only is it underpinned with humility it's all about forgiveness forgive, it, forgive yourself for being an alcoholic forgive yourself for harm that was done to you for try to make amends where you can without doing further harm and try to live life without doing further harm by doing a spot check inventory when things are going a bit weird you can just say this doesn't feel right and I don't know why what do you mean it doesn't feel right well, I don't feel right and I need to work out what's making me feel this way I feel this way for a reason something feels lovely, wrong, good, bad or ugly it can be any of those things or all of them together so, listen I don't feel right I need to get a breath of fresh air and then come back and talk or share how I feel, why what's going on and then you, that's the assertive bit and then the empathy bit is how do you feel about it or, you know, do we f are we feeling the same way the empathy is the connection and where love tr truth love and wisdom start to happen in the moment of now you also get the people that tell you to fuck off as well which is pretty good if it's immediate like that you say ok I don't need to hang around here for that and I'm not being smug about it, I'm smiling about it because if somebody tells me to fuck off doesn't want me in their company it's a very good answer, fine you know, you're not there to ego will put you in a fight confidence to walk away truthfully it's obviously not right I must, I must go and you mustn't do things which are against your principles or values as long as you know what your principles and values are it's all about learning what what is right now and that serenity prayer, thank goodness for that the serenity prayer to God or simply in good conscience or to the universe it is, I say to the universe my meditation and prayer is to a power greater than me which I would never be able to define or understand although science is getting closer to where they don't understand things they just don't understand more things and then they understand some more things and because they understand some more things the, the picture gets even bigger and bigger and bigger so I like to keep it in the day because that's what I was built for I realise now living in the moment so to God or in good conscience the serenity prayer can do, can't do wisdom to know the difference God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference just for a day moment by moment minute by minute hour by hour I can ask for help if I can't work it out and that's the wisdom to know the difference more tomorrow if I can <laughs>